So welcome everyone here. Uh, today I will tell you about what I've been doing for the past three years. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to do it in 45 minutes. That's going to be a bit difficult. Uh, so if anything things seems unclear, you're welcome to uh, ask questions afterwards. And this is a very special day because in addition to doing my PhD, I'll be talking about what I enjoy talking about the most, which is how we can learn to gain control over our own brain activity using a process known as neurofeedback. So neurofeedback is this technology where we can uh, measure with our brain scanners and an activity here and analyze it in real time and show it back as a feedback signal to this test subject and they learn to gain control over their own brain activity. I'm going to describe neurofeedback and then I'll describe an experiment I did in order to test whether neurofeedback can improve how we perform multisensory integration, multisensory perception. Can neurofeedback change how the brain combines, in this case, auditory and visual stimuli to create multisensory experiences? Then I'll discuss if neurofeedback can help us understand causality, the link between a certain brain activity and a cognitive function. Can neurofeedback provide evidence that certain brain activity cause cognitive functions? Then lastly, I'll discuss awareness in neurofeedback, which is the specific question, how do we measure whether uh, participants can become aware of the intention or purpose of the experiment to change their behavior? All right. To get the ball rolling, I'll have this analogy, which is the relationship between shark attacks and ice cream sales. We know that there's a link between the two. Whenever we buy more ice cream, they tend to go up more shark attacks. But the link between the two is a spurious correlation. In actuality, there's an underlying cause when the sun is more bright, there's a higher temperature, and that leads to more people going to the beach and more shark attacks. It also is the case that when there's more sun and more temperature, people tend to buy more ice cream. So the link between the two is a spurious correlation. There's an underlying cause. This is the same problem we have in neuroscience. We have a perception, a thought, emotion, anything like that, a cognitive phenomena. And then we have the observed brain activity that we're measuring with our scanners. We see variations in this activity and the cognitive phenomena but we don't know if this observed activity in the brain is truly causing that cognitive phenomenon. We, there might be activity that we don't see that changes, which causes the change in cognitive phenomena and the observed activity. In order for us to be certain that this is important, we need to change this activity, affect it somehow, to show that that is the underlying activity and that this activity is unimportant. So how do we do that? We have brain stimulation methods, TMS and TDCS, which apply a magnetic current or magnetic field and an electrical current to the brain, thus changing this activity and affecting the cognitive phenomena. I'm here to talk about an alternative, which is when we just ask participants to change that activity themselves. So neurofeedback is a psychophysiological procedure in which online feedback of neural activation is provided to the participant for the purpose of self-regulation. We pick up a signal fast enough with our scanners, analyze it fast enough, show it back as a feedback signal, and the participant gains control of their own brain activity. So how does this work? Time for some cats. All right, what are we seeing here? So if you're a normal human being, what you're seeing is a funny video. But for me, an abnormal human being or psychologist, what you're seeing is a discriminatory stimulus, a response, in this case, a brain response and a motoric response, and then a reinforcing reward. And operant conditioning theory states that physiological responses increase in probability if they are reinforced. Or in layman's terms, the cat will repeat the behavior, the animal will repeat the behavior because it's being rewarded. Now, what if instead you don't measure this motoric response, but just the brain response? Have the animal think about performing the behavior and that produces a brain response. You give the cat a reward for doing so, in this case, some milk, and it will repeat that brain activity. This works at a whole brain level, individual region level, and down to the individual neuron. If you inject dopamine into a neuron when it fires at a specific frequency, it will do so more often. So it's a principle throughout the nervous system. 
What you can do, and one consequence of this, is you can ask cats by giving them milk whenever they reproduce alpha activity, which is when neurons fire between 8 to 12 hertz or 8 to 12 times per second. If you increase this alpha activity, cats can become partially resistant to the toxic effects of rocket fuel. This is what NASA found out in the 60s, that having cats reproduce this alpha activity over and over and over again, they will become partially resistant to toxic effects of rocket fuel. This is now used in as effective treatment for epilepsy. So effective here has a special meaning, meaning that we can compare it against a double-blinded placebo control condition. So an, an example here is we take the brain activity related to pain. We downregulate the activity in the brain related to pain, and pain is reduced. We can compare this against a control group that tries to control their pain without neurofeedback, a group that just attends to their pain, a group which receives neurofeedback from a different area in the brain unrelated to pain. The area here that they do regulate related to pain is called the anterior cingulate cortex. The brain area that's unrelated to pain is the posterior cingulate cortex. And when they try to downregulate this, no reductions in pain is found. And you can also show false neurofeedback, feedback that's unrelated to anything, and that does not help either. But, so neurofeedback has this clinical potential. It has the potential for treating epilepsy, pain, ADHD, anxiety, tinnitus, and so on. But still, in a recent Nature Reviews neuroscience paper, it was said that we need more double-blinded RCTs of neurofeedback in order to truly evaluate the clinical effects. And one problem here is that sham neurofeedback and feedback that's not related to pain, maybe participants can become aware of this. So in addition to these clinical potential, neurofeedback can also address basic science questions. And that is because it allows us to take correlative evidence and turn it into interventional evidence. For example, when we ask participants to attend to this half of the visual field, um, alpha activity tends to go down in the corresponding hemisphere. This is one way, this is a correlation. But what if we instead ask participants to change this ratio of alpha themselves using neurofeedback that changes alpha and then measures of attention also change. And I should say here that some measures of attention change. This is the issue of causality. And this issue is perhaps more of a scientific question, should we call it causality or not? But again, the more we understand how alpha relates to attention, the better we will be able to create therapeutic options for disorders of attention like ADHD or other disorders related to attention. And one such disorder is visual spatial neglect, so which neurofeedback might be able to help. And this is a truly debilitating disorder where if you get a right-sided parietal cortex injury, you'll be una unable to attend to the left half of your visual field. So these patients are unable to draw a clock. They will miss this left half here. If they have to draw lines across these lines, mark them, they're unable to draw these left lines. When you downregulate alpha activity using neurofeedback in this area, these neglect symptoms improve. This has been shown in a number of studies. However, these studies are low sample size and they're uncontrolled studies, so they aren't compared against a placebo control, and thus we need to figure this out. Now, we need to create more controlled studies in visual spatial neglect. So this is where I would love to say that that is what I did, but instead, before my PhD, um, I hadn't performed a neurofeedback study, nor even a neuroimaging uh, event-related design, so I knew I needed to gain some experience. Um, so I have a basic science question, and this is where I use healthy volunteers that are easy to recruit. And in, and in clinical research, patients are more harder to recruit. And this is what we do in neuroscience. We build a model, an understanding of the brain, and we translate or apply that model to treat the brain. And this is because even though a healthy brain, a neurotypical brain, brain is different from a brain injured or unhealthy brain, there are some principles at work that we can translate. So what I wanted to do is, and this is all you really need to think of is, I wanted to train healthy volunteers, train their alpha activity such that they perceive stimuli differently. And that I hope I can translate to patients such that I can train their alpha activity such that they can perceive their left hemisphere. And the, the basic research question I'm dealing with is called the sound-induced flash illusion. It's a multi-sensory phenomena, but all you really need to know about it is 
there's some correlations between alpha and how participants perceive stimuli in this task. So this is a multisensory phenomena. And what you just need to know is you have good vision or vision has good spatial sense and your audition has poor spatial sense. And that's when, so when you determine location, when you're determining where this sound comes from, from the doll or from the ventriloquist, even though you know it's coming from this man here holding the doll, you hear it as if, as if it's coming from the doll. And that's because you have good spatial sense visually. So you rely more on your vision. The opposite scenario is that your vision has poor temporal sense and your audition has good temporal sense. So if I show you a lot of flashes really fast, you'll be unable to tell how many flashes occurred. But if I tell you, tell you beep sounds, say beep, 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 you can go back in time and say one, two, three, four, five. It's easier for you to do that auditorily. And that's when, when you have to determine numerosity, how many things there were, you tend to rely on your audition rather than your vision. And that leads to this phenomena here. When you present a flash along with a beep sound, what happens is if you can present an extra beep sound 50 milliseconds afterwards, participants will sometimes experience two flashes. Like there's an additional flash out of nothing. Basically what's happening here is as you're doing this, you have a beep sound and a flash, it's kind of like a clap, that has an auditory output and a visual output of my hands touching. But if you were to hear two claps, but you didn't see it, you're drawn to think maybe his hands touched two times. And that's what's happening, but here in a controlled experimental setting. This has been shown in over 200 papers. So importantly, this percept correlates with alpha activity. But we have this problem, like I mentioned in the beginning. This activity is correlated with the cognitive phenomena. We don't know if this observed activity is truly important unless we intervene on it and see changes in the cognitive phenomena, thus showing that this other activity is unimportant. All right, so that's what I did. I have an experiment where I have flashes presented in the left half and the right half of the visual field that is processed in the corresponding hemisphere. What I can then do is I can have a theoretical trained hemifield and an untrained hemifield and ask my participants to downregulate alpha in one hemisphere and increase it in the other. As they do so, these black lines here, they become more black, they become clearer. And so what I'm doing here is I'm hoping that I can downregulate alpha and that that will lead to then more illusions in a post-test. And those illusions should happen more in this side, in this side where the corresponding alpha has been downregulated, compared to the other side where I've upregulated alpha. And I have two groups that does this. Now you're gonna ask me, is it rewarding to see black lines becoming clearer? No, it's not a reward. But humans have this ability where if you tell them that they're bad at something, they become annoyed. And if you then tell them that now you're performing well, they become happy again. And you do this over and over and over again, every second for 25 minutes, and they will learn to gain control over their brain activity. And this is neurofeedback. I should say that I have a couple of conditions. I have one flash and two beep conditions, but I also have three beeps and one flash condition, four beep and one flash condition, and some control conditions when there's an equal amount, two, uh, one beep and one flash, two beeps and two flashes. That'll become important. I just want to show off our uh, real-time mech setup at Skyview. This is what I use the most of my PhD on. We have the participant inside this scanner here, and we're taking the data to an acquisition computer, which gets the data in real-time, analyzing it using a classification computer of alpha in real-time, then to a stimulus PC, and it's sent to a projector, and then into the scanning room that has a magnetic shield so that we can measure this magnetic field around the head better. In actuality, this is what it looks like. I have the classification computer running right here, a real-time analysis of alpha, and this is the visual representation of what the subject is seeing in there. And then over here, we have the participant inside the scanner, and we have here the acquisition computer that's measuring their alpha and measuring their brain activity in real time. And this is sent over the network using some scripts. 
And again, here the classification computer. This here is a very important cable for everything to work. And uh, this is running an analysis that's removing the magnetic noise in the room in there. And it's also getting a measure of alpha and the alpha in different hemisphere. That's then translated to a signal here that the patient is or participant is seeing. And then we also have a real time analysis of their eye movements. So we can make sure that they're looking at the center of the screen because looking to left and right will also influence alpha. So again, I just want to reiterate the hypothesis here. I'm hoping that they will see more flashes in one side, in this side, the side where it's trained, this trained hemifield or these orange bars, or in the opposite case, the untrained or green bars, I'm hoping that they go down. So if you uh, hope like I do, you're hoping to see some orange bars that go up and some green bars that go down. That's not what I saw. Uh, instead, what I saw was that there was no change between the two things. Um, and this was the same for uh, the numeric disparity of 2B1 flash, 3B1 flash, and 4B1 flash. So uh, yeah, that was a bit of a bummer. Um, what I then began to think of was maybe neurofeedback only has an effect, but it's short lasting. It's only maybe five minutes. So I started to look at the first block following neurofeedback, and this is where I found an indication of an effect. But it was only for these two beep one flash trial, not the three beep or four beep one flash trial. So two beep one flash, that's where you have this clap, clap, and you're only seeing one clap. Whereas with four beep one flash, there's a lot of claps. So I began to think of it like this. Maybe two beep one flash is where the auditory and visual signals are likely to originate from the same source in the world. It's unlikely that they originate from the same source in the world when you have four beeps and one flash. So when the numeric disparity goes up, it's unlikely. And maybe alpha activity that I've been training is involved in resolving this inference. And alpha activity is an index of attention. So maybe attention is involved in resolving the inference that the two signals originate from the same source in the world. And perhaps multisensory integration breaks down when the disparity between signals becomes too large, such that attention or alpha cannot resolve it. Or you could see it like this, that alpha is important for the phenomena, but it depends on the inferred source in the environment. And as I began to think like that, I uh, reread a paper that I perhaps should have read a bit more before I designed the study, which showed that the previous trial influences the subsequent trial. So when there's low disparity, when the signals are likely to originate from the same source, multisensory integration is enhanced on the next trial. And this effect depends on alpha. So knowing that, what I could do is I could re-examine my data and see what if we have a very likely that they come from the same source. We have two beeps and two flashes. And here, over here, it's really unlikely because it's four beep and one flashes. Then I can look at the subsequent trial, two beep and, two, and one flash, and do that over here as well. And this is exactly where I find my effects. I find that alpha is important only when it's, really re it's been really reliable that the two things come from the same source in the world and on the subsequent uh, illusion trials like this. So we're able to write that neurofeedback modulation of the sound-induced flash solution using parietal cortex alpha oscillations reveals the dependency of the prior multisensory congruency. And this is, in general, this is a new way to investigate multisensory perception. We need to replicate these findings in order to be certain, of course, but it suggests that alpha is important, but also how the observer infers the causal structure of the previous stimuli. And alpha as an index of attention affects multisensory integration but it depends on the prior knowledge or the expectation of the observer. And this has also been shown in some review papers or suggested in some review papers. So onto the next issue of causal inference. Can neurofeedback help us provide causal evidence from such a thing as alpha activity and the cognitive phenomena? When we even have this, this subset of trials here, two beep, two flashes, two beep, um, one flash, are we showing here that alpha causes multisensory perception. Can you say when you've trained alpha and changes attention that low alpha causes attention? When we intervene on anterior cortex activity and we reduce pain, 
using neurofeedback, can we then say that anterior cingulate cortex activity was the cause of pain? I'm using the interventionist definition of causality, X causes Y when a variable X is intervened on and varied systematically while measuring the change, in this case, the probability distribution in the outcome Y while controlling for confounding causes sets of the change in Y. And this is why X is set in this case. So there are some who say that neurofeedback can provide causal evidence. They say neurofeedback like brain stimulation takes brain activity as an independent variable and affects cognition as the dependent variable. And therefore they say neurofeedback can provide causal evidence. But there's one review that says, well, maybe neurofeedback might allow researchers to address questions of causality rather than mere correlations. And this has actually been shown in the empirical literature as well that some papers will claim that since we intervened on alpha and that changed attention, that means that alpha causes attention. But then you have other papers that reduce alpha, they see changes in connectivity, and then they say that correlated with a change in mind wandering, which is a measure of attention. So again, we intervened on alpha and it caused a change in attention, or we intervened on alpha and as we did so, it correlated with a change in attention. So there's differences in, in the interpretations, in the conclusions, using the same methodology. This is a problem in science. I think that what you should do is, you should go to Google Scholar and say, can neurofeedback provide evidence of direct behavior causality? And when the results don't impress you, you should write a paper about it. So that's what I did, <laughs> or we did. <laughs> and uh, what we acknowledge is that neuroimaging cannot give you causality. You see some variations in brain activity and some cognitive function, that's a correlation. With brain stimulation, what you have is a magnetic or electrical current from outside the head, you know where it's coming from. It might jump around, it might produce activity in some other area, but at the end of the day, you're getting a change in cognitive process due to the amplification of a known magnetic or electrical field. The example that we're working with is EMG biofeedback here. And that is where you ask participants to downregulate muscle activity. You ask them to relax their muscles. And as they do so, their attention improves. So we're taking a feedback variable of your muscle activity and we're downregulating this feedback variable and your attention improves, a cognitive phenomenon. Should we then say that the muscles cause attention? No. You're affecting some brain area that's then affecting muscle activity. And this brain area also happens to be involved in attention. Now we deal with the neurofeedback case. You've picked some feedback variable in the brain. You might have hit the correct one. And now as you do, you're changing this cognitive process. That may allow you to say something about direct causality, but you might have also just picked a feedback variable, a brain area that's being affected by some other area. And you have no way of discriminating this when you've just performed one study. That's that you're not, only, you cannot discriminate between indirect and direct causality. You can say that it's not a correlation, it's more than mere correlation, but you cannot discriminate, you cannot arbitrate between these. And this is actually also said in this paper I mentioned about the anterior cortex. Maybe the ACC uh, causes pain, but maybe is controlled by some top-down connection from a higher order region that causally affects ACC and pain as independent quantities. Now, what can this, um, this discussion be used for? Well, it's a problem because in the neurofeedback field, we have claims that we've trained alpha and that causes a change in attention, but that conflicts with the rest of the neuroscientific literature where they use other approaches like frequency tagging approaches and these steady state visual evoked uh, potentials, which then show that alpha is uncorrelated with attention. And I think uh, Gunlach here from Cerebral Cortex says it best. He says that some hidden attentional dynamic, something else is causing alpha and causing attention. And this is exactly what we discussed in our paper. A recent uh, trends in neuroscience paper has actually said the same thing that we uh, discuss. Uh, so this is a problem. We have neurofeedback studies coming out that's claiming one thing, and that conflicts with the rest of the literature. One area where neurofeedback might have a greater extent to establish causality is when it's performed without the awareness of the participant. 
Now, what you can do is you can measure a very specific cognitive function. You can present black lines like this at different degrees. What we can do is we can find the brain area that's related specifically to individual degrees. And we use a approach, machine learning approach, decoding or an AI, which learns the specific brain area related to the visual representation of these lines. Then we ask you to reproduce that activity again and again and again using neurofeedback. Whenever you reproduce it, this green disc here becomes larger. Now afterwards, you are better at representing these black lines. You're faster at reacting to them because your brain has replayed it even though you've not seen the stimuli. You've just seen it once in order for this AI to learn it. Now you're reproducing it and you are learning to become better at processing this without stimulus presentation. Now, along with this claim has been that participants are also unaware that they are receiving neurofeedback as they are increasing this disk here. And importantly here, they use something called the information transmission analysis to look at what is the brain like when you're presenting this stimuli consciously. And here, other areas of the brain cannot predict the visual response in the trained area. But doing what's claimed as unconscious neurofeedback, these other areas can't. So here, doing conscious presentation, some other area can predict the change in the trained area, whereas doing unconscious neurofeedback, other areas or indirect areas cannot predict it. So that lends support to the idea of direct causality rather than indirect causality. Now, what this leads me to ask is, how do we assess awareness in neurofeedback studies? Can the subject become aware of the intention or the purpose of the neurofeedback experiment? And this also relates to the issue of the double blind. Is the double blind possible in clinical neurofeedback studies? This is the issue I mentioned in the beginning from this Nature Reviews neuroscience paper. It are, is sham neurofeedback detectable by the, patient, by the participant and by the patients in clinical studies? So one weird aspect here is that the studies I mentioned before, which use this information transmission analysis, they actually don't test for awareness. They reference some previous papers, which does test for awareness. So I'm not gonna, uh, I'm gonna spare you the details about this, about how they test awareness and tell you about how I decided to test awareness. So I wanna remind you again, I wanna increase the participants' attention and multisensory perception to one side. I want them to have more illusions, more multisensory experiences in one side. I don't know which side. The participant in my study doesn't know which side either, but I'm testing him before and after. Now, after the post-test, I'm doing then a post-scan questionnaire. And what I'm doing here is I'm trying to get to know my participants. And remember, this is a double blind. I don't know which side they're supposed to increase this in. And what I do is I'm inspired by um, an approach from neurophenomenology called the elicitation interview method, where I guide the participant into an introspective posture to gather reports about their pre-reflexive experiences. Now, pre-reflexive here, the participant hasn't thought that much about what it is the intention of the purpose is or purpose of the experiment is. And this is a pretty weird experiment. Um, a lot of my participants said so. You're seeing black lines becoming clearer for 25 minutes. You're being told that you're gonna train your brain activity. That's pretty weird. Then you see these flashes and your beep sounds and more beep sounds and flashes that are not there. Participants came out of my experiment saying, this is the weirdest thing I've ever done. Um, so if I just asked them at that point, so what do you think the purpose is of this experiment? I think they would say to me that um, maybe you should know. Right? And uh, what I could walk away with is data saying, well, the participants were unaware of the purpose of the experiment. So what I instead do is I do this post-scan questionnaire where I sort of ask them, I get to know them. What, is, what was the strategy you were using during your feedback? Was it a visual strategy, an auditory strategy? What strategy would you recommend for a friend? I discuss what it was like for them. I get them to think about the experience they just had. And then what I do is I tell them about the sound-induced flash illusion, that you can experience these illusions. Don't worry, your brain is totally normal for doing so. But do you think that you were experiencing more flashes or less flashes before or after neurofeedback? 
Then I tell them that, well, what was your confidence in doing so? Were you more confident or less confident after neurofeedback? And importantly, these are just decoy purposes because I want them to have more multisensory experiences on one side. I'm not interested in more flashes or less flashes overall. I'm not interested in their confidence either. That's not important. That's, those are decoy purposes. Then I raise the possibility of the actual purpose, which is I ask them, so were you attending more to the left side or to the right side doing your feedback? And this is the actual purpose. And remember, I don't know which group they're in. They don't know which group they're in. Then what I can do is, since I've raised the possibility of decoy questions, decoy purposes, and this actual purpose, I can now ask them this question. I give them six rectangular squares like this, and I tell them that represents the confidence in what it is you think the neurofeedback was trying to change about your behavior. So the feedback was meant to make me experience less flashes in the task overall or more flashes in the task overall, or it was meant to, for me to respond faster after neurofeedback or slower after neurofeedback. And then there are these actual things that, that are correct, which they don't know, experience more flashes in the right side or experience more flashes in the left side. Then there's also a random option if they think the feedback was just random. And what I tell the participant is, I don't know which group you're in, but your experience is what matters. You are the expert in what you experience, and you could put anyone here. You can put two here if you think it was this maybe a little bit. Maybe you think it was maybe this a little bit or that, and they can put it wherever they want. If they're really certain, they'll put it in all, all of them in one, or if they want to put one in each, then, then do that. But it's your experience. So you tell me what it is you think the neurofeedback was trying to change about your behavior. And I give them a neuroscientific explanation for every one of these. I say to them, we can change the way the brain processes flashes. So that would lead to a change in that you could experience more or less. We can change the, the confidence in the brain, and that will also change how fast you respond. So this is also an option. We can also change how your brain processes things in the left and right side. We know that already. So this is also an option. And sometimes in these neurofeedback studies, the feedback is random. So if, if that's what you think it was, then you could put some here. And I tell them, yeah, that's, and then what happens here is that what I'm of course hoping for is that some will put, put it here. And what I find is that there are five out of my 20 participants who put blocks here. Those five, they guess their correct sign. They're not guessing the opposite sign. And those participants who were able to guess, so those who put these here and guess the right sign, they were also correct about, or they also say that they attended more to their trained side during neurofeedback, and when asked in the end, do you think the intention of the experiment was to change your attention to one side, they also tend to guess correct. So what we can write is that a subset of participants gain a degree of awareness. Again, they're not putting all of the red squares in the right one, they're just putting some of them. So a degree of awareness of the intentions as evidenced by their uh, correct guesses uh, to the trained side, and that was specific to the double-blinded group assignments. And we argue that this, uh, it's crucial to test the validity of the double-blinded procedure in neurofeedback studies um, in order to be certain of clinical effects. And we suggest the use of this extensive contingency awareness questionnaire like ours. So in conclusion, um, I present a new way to investigate multisensory perception using neurofeedback and the sound-induced flash illusion. I show a dependency on the prior stimulus um, here, and this also allows me to build a model for spatial neglect if I can train alpha and see changes in how healthy brains process stimuli, then maybe I can also train alpha and change how patients uh, respond to stimuli, specifically in the left hemisphere. Then we discuss neurofeedback in paper two, where we discuss this indirect causality that neurofeedback might affect something indirectly in the brain, and that affects what is being trained, giving the illusion of direct causality, but it is in fact perhaps only an indirect causal way. Then we present this new awareness questionnaire, which we think is a good way to start measuring awareness in neurofeedback studies. 
And we show that a subset of participants gain a degree of awareness here. In a larger sense, this PhD has been trying to advance the field of neuroscience and uh, or neurofeedback. And I'm indebted to Aarhus University and the Faculty of Health for providing me some funding for doing just that. Um, and I think that this is necessary because there are some issues in the field. Uh, I think you can see it here with, with paper one that I thought that the effect was going to be on all conditions. And I had this idea that alpha was related to multisensory perception in the sound induced flash solution. So it should affect all conditions. But what we often find, and this is what I also mentioned about alpha, training alpha only affects some measures of attention, not all of them. And this is also a problem we see in the field of neurofeedback. Often when there's really good reason for why it should work, it doesn't. Um, and then as you saw in paper two, there are some issues with how we interpret our effects. Is this indirect and direct? And this is something that we still need to figure out in, uh, in the field of neurofeedback. And last, you saw in paper three, um, where I argue that there are better ways of assessing awareness in neurofeedback studies. And this is important for clinical research. And um, we are still trying to figure this out. And I promise you that if there's a way to train brain activity in order to treat mental disorders and brain injury, then we will find a way to do that. And I say we, because I wouldn't be able to do it without my supervisor, Morten Orgo, Christopher Bailey, and my co-authors, Thomas Ross and Masood, and Samanlu, and my research assistants who've been helping out, uh, helping with funding acquisition from Simon Yebebia, and all of my colleagues for amazing discussions and suggestions uh, along the way, as well as the SIFIN admins who are really nice and help me out with so many things, as well as my family and friends. Uh, who've been there to help me get distracted from this thing that I can talk about for so long. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Tina. Uh, the committee will now begin the examination. Yeah. Uh, first up is Jyoti Mishra from uh, Sleepy San Diego. It's about uh, six in the morning there, I think. Uh, Jyoti, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, thank you, Timo, for such a nice um, presentation. Um, okay. I had a few questions for you. Um, one okay. question. Uh, we're just trying to get you uh, onto the screen here so people can see you. Sure. Uh, yeah. Very well. At least you can hear them. <laughs> uh, how do we make her bigger then? That's good. I guess you can turn around and have a look. Yeah. Okay, thanks. For um, yeah, congratulations on um, a nice presentation. Um, the questions I had for you were, um, the first one is, in your first experiment, do you have any objective way of telling us um, how um, uh, the person was performing neurofeedback in terms of their accuracy? Were there more times that they uh, received um, the, you know, the, the feedback that you were giving them in terms of the um, Gabor's getting um, more, you know, darker or um, longer durations on those. Is there is there any um, objective way to quantify that beyond the subjective reports from the five persons that you um, said were more confident? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, I can answer a question, but I can't figure out the Zoom thing. Um, Just leave it in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, so we use this method of source localization in order to have, a, we take an MRI image and we then take the MEC data that we have and through various ways, we figure out where the activity is coming from. Um, and this allows us to say how much alpha is in the left side and the right side as the participant is performing neurofeedback in order to evaluate their performance in doing so. And here, what we find is that it was generally easier for the left group, those that were increasing alpha in the left side compared to the right side in doing so. This is this left group that has to increase alpha in the, in the left side 
and the right side, they have to downregulate. And they, this was apparently easier for this group compared to the right-sided group, um, which was not able to do so. So you can think of it like you ask someone to, to tighten their, their right shoulder or tighten their left shoulder in this case, and that was more easy for them to do than the opposite. And this has actually also been shown in other uh, publications. So this is one way that we can evaluate how a participant is doing. Um, I think what you, what you might ask next, Jyoti, is that was there a correlation between how well an individual participant was able to do this and then the change in the multi-century phenomena? And that correlation was not correlated. That was not significant. So we cannot show that there's a biological gradient for how the change in the brain activity relates to the change in the multi-century processing. Great. Well, thank you for um, uh, figuring out my next question. So that was that was good. Um, was there any um, kind of correlation that you observed in terms of um, the degree to which an individual saw these percepts in the first place? So some individuals usually see them, you know, more the illusion more than others, and and the change that you observed um, after the neurofeedback. Was there any such um, predisposition that you saw? Uh, I don't actually remember if I even looked for that, no. Um, what I did was I wanted the amount of illusions to be equal in the different groups. And there I used this method where I, I measure how much illusions they are having, not just how lateralized their illusions are to the left and right in the beginning, but also the amount of illusions. And I then try to make sure that that was equal between the groups as they are coming in, as they're being allocated. But I haven't looked at whether the amount of illusions to begin with correlated with uh, how much it was changed. Is that what you're asking? Yes, that's what I'm asking because um, in experiments where we've done, um, I looked at the sound induced illusion when it was part of my thesis, we were looking at um, you know, the neural correlates of the illusion, which others have done as well. So when we um, look at those, there's, there are you know, event-related phenomena that are more related to the predisposition of seeing an illusion than really, um, than, which may be uh, potentially more interesting targets for neurofeedback than the, um, than the left-right alpha that you might have trained. So um, we didn't get into that in your thesis as to other potential correlates that are more direct targets of this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, in, initially I wanted to, to look at, can I increase the amount of illusions overall? Uh, can I get them to experience more illusions in general? Um, but what I did find was that what was being done and the more sort of appropriate methodology was this lateralization of alpha. And this idea um, about training attention uh, to one side or the other. So I used the, the paradigm that was, had been sort of reliably tested um, recently. Um, but one idea would be just to increase alpha or decrease alpha in the, uh, in the area, in the parietal cortex or occipital cortex and get an uh, amount of increases in illusion probability up or down. Great, and um, uh, one last question would be, what are your thoughts on, um, uh, on uh, methods other than neurofeedback that might be able to change uh, the illusory percept? Hey, well, I mean, one uh, study that I was looking into in the beginning was this study by Siri in, uh, in uh, current biology where they do apply TDCS to change the individual alpha uh, frequency of the participant. I know Julian has also shown this, that the individual alpha frequency relates to their illusion percepts. And if you then apply TDCS to the area, I think it is occipital that they do apply it to, they can change how well you're integrating it and even how long the audit auditory signals need to be from each other. And by driving 
uh, alpha in a different way, you can change how readily you're integrating based on the, um, based on the distance between the two beeps. Um, so I think that TDCS, there is a sort of a known way to do it, uh, to affect alpha and see changes in uh, the illusion. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, what do you think about the, the Bayesian con context? That would be my last question. Um, do you think that's a way to train um, uh, perceptual uh, illusions if you were to change the environmental Bayesian context of how many other kinds of stimuli are around? Or is, do you think that's very short lived? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there is, uh... Uh, there is a paper that trains these more make more congruent stimuli between uh, visual and uh, I think it's a it's a paper by Ulvo who does exactly that. He, he provides an easy way to increase multisensory experience. I think it's something like that, um, and that changes how readily you're able to integrate multisensory stimuli. Um, I think that that is, yeah, there's one way to train it. And I think that our results do show something similar. I think that the two beep, two flash condition that you're having just before is something that is in some sense showing the participant or <laughs> training them in some sense that these two things originate from the same source in the world and therefore it affects the, the subsequent um, the subsequent perception. The, but it does uh, it does make me bring up this thing that I actually had planned to to bring up. Um, so yeah, one thing you can do is if you have a binocular rivalry paradigm, that's where you present one stimuli to one right eye and then one to the left eye. This is a different percept that you're placing, and people will have a different uh, experience but they shift between perceiving what's from the right eye or from the left eye. Now, expert meditators, people who have been meditating for over 10,000 hours, they claim that they can control which of these percepts they're seeing. They can control whether they're seeing this percept or this percept. For us, uh, people who don't meditate so much, we're, we, if we try to attend to one of these, after some time, we lose the given percept and we switch between the two. What has been shown in the paper by Van E is that you can do this in a multi-sensory uh, way as well. If you have this disc here, which is at a constant rotation to one eye, and then have this looming pattern to the other eye where it is looming pattern, meaning that it's, it's pushing out like this, and these are at different frequencies. What you just need to know is there's two visual type of stimuli at different rates at which they are rotating or looming out or sort of coming out like this. Then what you have is an auditory stimuli that's supporting this visual representation and then an auditory stimuli that's, that's supporting this visual representation. Now participants have to attend to this or to that and they're better, better able to do so if there's a supporting auditory stream underneath. Now that shows you that the multisensory congruency, the way in which this stimuli supports this visual stimuli, helps participants in attending to the uh, multisensory stimuli here, and they're more able to hold it. So multisensory congruency becomes a mechanism for attentional control over multisensory perception. And I think that that, along with our study showing that the previous trial, where there's again a multisensory congruency between two beeps and two flashes, leading to two beep and one flashes, where we've trained alpha and thereby attention, it's also showing the same thing. And when you couple that with the na nature communication paper by Tim Rohe, what you will see here is that the recent small disparity trials, or when there's high congruency, is related to multisensory perception on the subsequent trial, and that is moderating alpha. So this, I think, is all showing the same thing. Um, I don't know if that judge counts as a type of training, but this is, you could say that the previous or the other stimuli that the participant is attending to 
is influencing how readily they're able to perform multisensory perception. And these are some of the ways to do it. Great, thank you. I don't have any further questions at this time. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Jotia. Next up will be Professor Yunian Kara, who will uh, proceed to examine uh, Timo. Uh, should I yeah. send some? Maybe, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, First of all, thank you for the very informative talk. I've learned a lot, actually. Um, so let me just jump into what Yoti was talking about last, about these differences um, and what, what you were talking about with the Bayesian approach. So you mentioned that on the one hand, you see that the previous trial influences your illusion perception, right? But you also said in your talk that the neurofeedback effects were short-lived, so were only present in the first block. Did you combine these two aspects? So did you look at whether the effect of the previous trial is stronger in the first block than in the last block? Because here you show across all blocks. So is it like, it's like an interaction, like an additive or multiplicative interaction between these two things? Uh, one of the biggest limitations with, with this uh, previous trial analysis is that there's very few trials uh, that we can compare here. And this is also noted in the paper. There's, very few trials where, because I'm dealing with what subsequent or what's preceding the 2B1 flash, and there's only so many 2B1 flash trials. So I think we're dealing with something like five trials. And this is the reason why we say this is a feasibility study, it's more similar to a pilot study because this is not the uh, hypothesis we had. We had to change our hypothesis on the fly. This is not something we should usually do. Um, but this is the only way the data provides a story that makes any sense, I would say. But yes, it should be combined because what I would expect is for the effect to be larger in the first block. Um, there's several other papers showing that neurofeedback has an effect and then it goes back. It's, it's like a training a muscle. It will, be, it will change, but then it will go back and potentially also rebound. And from your intuition, so, so if, on the one hand, we have Bayesian learning. So Bayesian short-term learning, I, I see a congruent multisensory trial and I learn for a short time that the world is made up of multisensory stimuli that should be combined. And on the other hand, we have this mechanism that you're specifically training your alpha band power. So from your intuition, what would you think is in, in an in a everyday sense, the stronger effect? A like alpha band, whatever that is, or Bayesian learning? Well, we, um, we know that attention doesn't exert an effect in the ventriloquist paradigm, and we know it exerts an effect in the McGurk paradigm. But here, when we're dealing with the sound-induced flash solution paradigm, and also this looming paradigm by an upper rivalry paradigm, it seems that you need multisensory congruency and attention in order for attention to exert an effect. Uh, maybe it exerts an effect in this first block, maybe, but um, I think that for these two paradigms at least, you need attention and multisensory congruency and they seem to interact for some reason. Mm -hmm. Let me just pick on that one, more, one, like one final step, because I'm not sure, I, I, I think you referenced the paper in your dissertation as well uh, from, uh, from Hearst et al., the, the review paper yeah. on the 20 years of sound induced flash illusion. They um, look at aging, like different at the sound induced flash illusion in different ages. Mm -hmm. So you, now, if I understand you correctly, you say, I need to have had an experience of multisensory integration to have this illusion. So would you assume that this effect becomes stronger with age? So if, if you use a infant or a child that has, has, hasn't had that much experience in life, right? yeah. combined with an, with an aging population that has had like a, a lot of uh, experience with uh, multisensory integration. Uh, yes, I mean, the degree to which the multisensory congruency aspect affects, uh, yeah, it should. As we see that, the elderly will have had more experience with combining auditory visual stimuli, then that should have affected this phenomenon. Yeah, you're right. But you, have, you haven't, so your participants were the student population or? I have not tested whether, yeah, yeah they were mostly student population. Okay. 
Um, let me take a larger, large step back to your um, to your introduction to your uh, to your um, thesis, where you state, and as you stated in your in the beginning of your um, presentation, that you originally want to look at spatial neglect. That was your goal goal to to, to look at how to like you use a therapy for spatial neglect. <laughs> And I was wondering, okay, you, you want to look at spatial neglect. Why do you use a multi-sensory integration task? They do actually have differences in the sound-induced flash solution as well. But I wouldn't test them on that uh, sound-induced flash solution. Um, I wanted to look at something uh, that was training alpha and having participants change their attention. And the obvious thing to do was to, to do something that had already been done, uh, which is just to change measures of attention. Um, but we became interested in this sound-induced flash solution, and it seemed like there were some questions there about whether alpha truly causes this illusion. And that um, led us to do that study instead. Okay, if you, like, now you're three years older, three years wiser, mm -hmm. would you do it again? Uh, well, actually, yes, because we would like to replicate this effect and see that it's there. Um, but we also have other things that we want to do. Um, I mean, it's in, your, in your talk as well, you mentioned uh, frontal theta, for example, uh, and that is related how it's related to cognitive control. And um, this is something we're also interested in. Can you then regulate frontal theta and see changes in, in cognitive control? Um, there are many different things and applica applications you can use with neurofeedback. Um, but yeah, most importantly, I wanna build a model of spatial neglect and then actually apply that model um, and have spatial neglect patients. Uh, yeah, form alpha neurofeedback. I'm, 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 I wasn't too sure. So spatial neglect patients, they have difficulties in the sound use flash living? Yes. Yeah, I think so. But they will have differences in the, in the uh, opposite case where there's, a, there's two flashes and one beep, mm -hmm. and then you experience um, less flashes than the, mm, the, the diffusion illusion. Yeah, yeah. Diffusion. Okay. Yeah. Or fission, I can never. One, no, I, 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 never, I never get the get the names right. So, so if I was to build a better model, I would have used that illusion as well. But yeah. that illusion is more unreliable. Yeah. yeah. So we decide not to use that. Okay. And now to jump into one. Uh, so you, you just mentioned um, you okay. One could manipulate frontal theta, for example. And I was wondering. So you targeted parietal alpha power, right? Because that's something that has been done before. Um, and you also use the source localization to look at the sources of the alpha band power. Can you, you, you showed the slide before, can you go back to the... Uh, yeah, this one, this one, this one. No, 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 the other one, this one. Yeah, because there was, there was wondering because on the left side for the whole brain, that is where alpha band power was, where you saw your change in alpha band power, right? Mm -hmm. And the smaller brain insert, that was your region of interest where you tested this, or yes, okay. And you only tested this within the region of interest, or did you also do a whole brain analysis to see where, el where else? It's occipital and, uh, and temporal and frontal as well. But okay. those are supplementary. Okay, okay. So because I was, I was actually wondering, um, so you, you specifically trained people to modulate their left, right hemisphere, like, like yeah. the alpha band lateralization. And I was wondering whether the, with this, um, for the for the for example, for the group on the left with the left side manipulation, it appeared to work. Yes. But I was wondering whether it's actually um, um, a not not a training problem, but a problem in defining the, the, the roys. So is it maybe that the that the lateralization isn't perfect for the left and right hemisphere, but shifted in a way? Did, so did you did you look at like different roy com, um, configurations or something like that? This is baseline corrected. Okay. To, uh, 20 seconds before I get a baseline and then everything you see is baseline to that. And But the thing about having this ratio between the two mm -hmm. is that you're having like a running baseline. Mm -hmm. 
where, you know, just as you say, arousal is important when you just, I mean, I, th I think if you just sit up a bit more, then alpha will probably change as well. Um, and that creates a problem if you're just measuring the whole thing. But if you have one side and another side, you can assume that arousal affecting both hemisphere the same, and then you're having this running baseline. Mm -hmm. No, I just had one question about, because now no, I just lost my train of thought about that. Um, oh, yeah, right. So um, can you remind me again? So in your neurofeedback task, um, the, it, it wasn't a visual detection task, but people all like saw this grating continuously. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, so I think there was Yoti uh, answered uh, asked this as well. So you don't really have a measure of do people get better in visual detection during the. During I have the um, I have something else. I do have sometimes throughout the neurofeedback, mm -hmm. I do present a small uh, dot. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's barely undetectable. Yeah. And we then can look at visual cortex, uh, whether there's an, an ERP response. Mm -hmm. But this was not significantly different. Okay. Whereas the previous uh, studies, they do show a significant difference between the two. Okay. And th th this is really the strongest case, I would say, for a link to spatial neglect. Because mm -hmm. that means that you're getting more energy into this area mm -hmm. uh, by having this training occurring. And that's exactly what you would want. I think for space and the patients, you want them to have an visual experience. Right. But you, you don't have a like you don't have a behavioral response. You just have the ERP. They are supposed to say after some time they get like a press left or right. Okay. Okay. So I just want them to make sure that they are still awake in there yeah. because I am not. That is the thing. I'm not controlling their brain. Yeah. I am giving them the, the the methods for doing so, but they are actually controlling their own brain. Yeah. And, and some of them take it very seriously and some of them don't. I think that that, maybe if I was to do the study again, uh, that would be the thing I would change the most is uh, give some sort of motivation, uh, some sort of monetary compensation for how well they're doing because you don't know if they are taking the task serious and you have no way of controlling that. They are controlling their own mm -hmm. brain. So speaking of motivation, these are students, right? Do they get yeah, paid, do yeah. they get paid yeah. or course credit? They, or? Were, they were just, yeah, they were paid uh, in accordance with their time, not okay. in, in accordance with their um, performance. Okay. Um, let me jump a bit to the um, to your third project to the second and third project so in so you mentioned that you used a you developed in a third project this post scan questionnaire to measure their awareness so, so we're, we're still sticking with the, it's the same experiment the same data same participants right mm -hmm. and now you uh, and, and at the same time you measured their awareness into the experimental procedures and mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, you mentioned that five out of your 20 participants, they kind of became aware mm. of what you were aiming to do. Mm. Is the awareness related to the performance? To the performance in the sci-fi and to the, like, also maybe in the ERPs and stuff like that? Like, uh, is this somehow, somehow uh, related to the to their ability to modulate alpha and to, to the changes in perception you see? Uh, I don't know, actually. That might be uh, one of the areas. So yeah, I should run a correlation between how, how or look at just the differences between those who yeah. gain awareness versus those who didn't and compare the change in alpha. So, because I'm not, I'm not an expert on neurofeedback, so I'm not super sure. Because I, from what I gathered from your from your dissertation is that somehow you don't really want your participants to be aware, right? Well, there are some who claim that that neurofeedback works without awareness, and so in some sense, I would like to show, I would like to gain a sensitive measure enough to say that maybe there's a way to show awareness. Uh, this is something we've shown in our group before, as we develop more sensitive measures of awareness, we tend to see this degree of awareness that participants have. But in a clinical sense, I wouldn't want the participant or patient in that sense to be aware, because then they would expect an effect, and then they might start to act like there's an effect, and then you have a whole placebo problem. 
Um, in the beginning, you mentioned the neural correlates of consciousness, the problem of inferring um, the, the neural source of a cognitive process by a correlational approach. So, um, and I was wondering, is this, so in, in many tasks, we don't really want our participants to become conscious of, like we want to test their consciousness. Like we want to, want to see the, the neural correlates of consciousness. For example, in your visual detection task, we want to, what you did with your ERP right now is you say the ERP is the neural correlate of the visual perception. One could say that, maybe with a little bit of a stretch. Um, and I was coming back to this awareness idea, and I was wondering whether you would say that what you see, so you see changes in alpha band power in during your neurofeedback, right? Would you say that the changes in this alpha band power lateralization correlates with this awareness? So is it like if I'm, so, is it the, the maybe you, you haven't looked at this right now uh, yet? Is it the participants that have the strongest lateralization? Are those the ones that are the most aware? So does it go together yeah. somehow? I would like to see that. I mean, this is. Um, I mean, and I mean more. Uh, what I would actually really like to see is if you were to do something like. What I would want to see is that these measures of how well the, uh, the rest of the brain can predict the change in the visual representation correlate with these tests of awareness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what I would want to see. But in order to really you know, build that idea, I would have to do what these okay. papers do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering whether it's, like, it's, is it possible that you, uh, do you, because I, I was like, from from a layman's perspective, I was thinking that so your task is you're seeing a grating and over 25 minutes you maybe become aware okay if I change process X or Y if I close my eyes the gratings become darker less dark yeah, darker the darker. more so I was I was wondering whether like is it like is it those people who have gained some sort of insight into the okay if I change process X and Y then the visual stimulus changes does that help with the whole neurofeedback thing mm, yeah yeah and I'm not sure if you, if you I have not looked at that but I should yes mm. and uh, this is also why I haven't submitted the third paper yet mm. is because I thought that I might get some some um, good suggestions here. So that would be just comparing those that gained awareness, those that I claim gained some degree of awareness, and compare their alpha um, and their change. Yeah, their change. Just a just a group compare. Like it's, it's five participants, so it's not that much, but just a group comparison between uh, correlation of awareness. And, uh, mm. um, let me. Do we still have time? Okay. <laughs> I have a whole list of questions. So I need. I need to just look. Okay. Let me need to to just look them up before I forget anything. I I can talk about neurofeedback all day. <laughs> um, you've talked about um, a lot about attention and alpha, right? Mm. So, and you, I think you mentioned in passing that maybe. Or could you, could you, give, could you give, a, give, a, give an idea whether you would say the alpha that you manipulated here is that attention or what is attention? Yeah, um, I don't think alpha causes attention. But so, uh, alpha doesn't cause attention. No, okay. but alpha is a good, training alpha is a good way to change attention. Okay. Yep, it's a good marker of some hidden process that probably causes alpha and causes attention. This hidden attentional dynamic, which we, I think, have yet to find. What is it? Um, but by training alpha, you are still seeing changes in attention. And it's one of the best ways or most reliable ways to change attention. If you want to do neurofeedback, then change alpha. Would you... If if you had unlimited, so now you're no, you're probably possibly soon gonna be a doctor and uh, probably at one point a professor and PI. Um, you have unlimited resources. Would you bet on being able to find the neural correlate of attention? 
and what would would it be if you would bet? Hmm. I don't know. Nah, I don't know if that's what I would go down and looking for. <laughs> right now, we're, we would be more looking at this uh, cognitive control because it seems like that is a is a more um, provides some nuance and also is a way to look at different paradigms like cognitive control in the sense of multicenter integration, as you talked about, um, but also cognitive control in other areas like self-control. Can you gain better self-control uh, by training this frontal thesis activity? And that has implications for addiction disorders and impulsivity disorders and so on. Um, so that's where I would, if I had the funding to do, that's what I would do with this. Yeah. And so again, if you maybe giving you uh, unlimited resources, so you've see, you've done neurofeedback now, and so if I if I'm correct, or can can you remind me again? So in your neurofeedback study, you use sensor level neurofeedback, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. So if you had unlimited resources, uh, what would you like? What would be the next steps to? improve what you've done here so you've done a neurofeedback study and it sort of worked yeah so what what would you say what's the next step what should, what should be done um well the instruction to the participant is key and uh, their motivation so monetary compensation i would do and head casts getting them to sit more still inside the mech scanner that's what i would improve um things of that nature will improve it a lot but I think what you're hinting at is, should I use source-based neuroimaging? And I don't see the immediate reason for doing so. I think that, I mean, when you compare it to these other approaches of getting their motivation higher, um, I think I do reference in the, in the thesis, a comparison between source-based neurofeedback and sensor-based neurofeedback for tinnitus. And the clinical effects are the same. So, I mean, I like these questions about how, getting uh, unlimited funding. But if I was to, uh, you know, in, for, for uh, applying for funding and sort of claiming I need source-based neurofeedback in order for it to work, I, I wouldn't be able to reference any studies because I, I don't see, I think we are all sort of hoping for that. And I would read that paper immediately, a comparison between neurofeedback with source-based and neurofeedback with sensor-based. Um, and a comparison between the two. Uh, there have been comparisons between fMRI from the amygdala compared to alpha theta from just scalp level. And there it seems that if you can get amygdala activity, you can reduce anxiety to a greater extent than just alpha theta at the scalp level. So it should be better to get a more reliable measure of the actual brain area that you yeah, amygdala is very much involved in anxiety. And so getting something that's more precise like that will in some cases help. But again, we are dealing with uh, signals that are on the cortical level. So you don't need anything fancy, I think. Uh, if you're dealing with that, you can, you can use sensors. Um, but I would really, I mean, I would love to develop that method. But right now, I think that it's better to increase motivation, get them to sit still, perhaps tell them more about, show them that they're actually getting neurofeedback. There were some participants, for example, that didn't believe that they were receiving neurofeedback and who said to me, uh, I don't think I'll be able to control this. And um, yeah, I think that that is what I would do because as a psychologist, that's probably also what I'm, I'm sort of more apt at. And if you, if I remember correctly, in the end, in the, in the, in the outlook of your, if your intro, you are talking a bit about, um, uh, where was it, uh, using like machine learning approaches, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, so right now you're focusing on alpha, right? Yeah. So could could you imagine that widening your search space? Could improve neurofeedback, or would this like, or do you think using a specific hypothesis and a specific mechanism is more precise? Yeah. So the, actually, the the first I think year of the PhD, I was 
having this exact uh, idea that I should use machine learning to figure the precise neural correlates. And that was partly also because you show, you show temporal cortex and beta power being important. And um, I wanted to see, maybe it's different for individual participants. Maybe for this participant, it's important this temporal and beta is important. Maybe gamma is a better for some participants. And um, especially when you're dealing with spatial neglect, then alpha, I mean, it might be important for the group overall, but for the individual patients having very unique damage, you need something that's tailored to the patient. So having machine learning like that would really help. But in the end, we went for something more simple related to alpha and training lateralization of, of alpha. And that was also partly because we wanted to, to be similar to the method that was already there in order to be more certain that we were getting the same effects. Okay. And I have one final question, if we have still have time, like one, one, one last question, if we now, because you've, you've talked about motiva motivating the participants. And um, so I'm, I'm wondering, so in this neural feedback, so you are looking at alpha and power lateralization, but you don't really tell participants what to do. So isn't there, isn't, so what, what's your opinion between the, again, this problem of awareness? So you, you have a specific hypothesis what you want the participants to do, yeah. but you don't tell them. No. So how can you be sure they're doing what they should? Like, why, like how can you be sure they're not just sitting there, like pressing their right shoulder that changes the muscle activity, which changes something? What I'm getting them to answer with a double pre uh, a button press every 10 seconds. That's, that's the only thing. And then I hope, and then I motivate them over the intercom. I say, you're supposed to do your best right now. And yeah, I hope that they're doing the right thing. And, but there were some participants who, just didn't perform well. Um, and there's also variations in like how noisy the room is for that patient uh, participant. And then they might get some learned helplessness. Um, and uh, yeah, that varies a lot. And would you, like you've, you've switched between participant and patient right now. Yeah. So how is it, like, I'm, not, I'm not sure, have you done this with patients? How accessible is neurofeedback as a therapeutic method for now my, my prejudice come out in non-computer used elderly patients. Like I'm not sure whether they are used computers or whether, whether, what's, their, what's their background. Like is it, is it usable? Is it feasible to use? And not, not MEC neurofeedback, but you will then use EEG neurofeedback and potentially use, um, use sort of consumer grade or even just single electrodes, two electrodes. And, um, and this is possible, but of course, best to have a sort of trained therapist who knows what they're doing and uh, uses, uh, knows the technical setup like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's, uh, that will be my questions. From the, so you. Well, thank you, Julian, for your question. Um, I'll ask uh, just a brief final question uh, from the part of the committee, uh, which is um, your, your study has a lot of applications to treatment of uh, diseases that might involve phantom perceptions, I would suppose. So, and I know that uh, neurofeedback has been used for trying to treat phantom sounds. Is there such a thing as phantom visual perceptions that's not like hallucinogen induced? Uh, is there, are there people who might benefit from that sort of neurofeedback? Like, uh, like visual illusions? Yeah. I, I don't actually know, but I suspect that for schizophrenia patients, they will have visual illusions that are correlated with some electrophysiological correlate mm -hmm. and that that might be, be used. Okay, so by, by illusions, though, it's not really the kind of illusions where everybody perceives the illusion, but uh, sort of a, a clinical phenomenon where people see things that the rest of us can't see that aren't there. Uh, does that make sense? Um, is there... Hallucinations. Yeah, so hallucinations that aren't hallucinogen-induced, I would suppose. Mm -hmm. um, or are there specific patient groups who suffer from them, things like that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. schizophrenia patients, yeah. I'd say. Okay. And I think that that is something that you're doing, but mm -hmm. one of the issues with that and neurofeedback is, you know, they have this specific um, 
problem that they think that people are trying to control them. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> it's not easy to tell them that now you're going to get, get put inside a scanner and mm -hmm. you're going to control your brain activity. That is an actual problem in for researchers mm -hmm. in that type of research. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the schizophrenic, schizophrenia populations are, are really hard to study and, and hard to yeah um, try to apply therapies to for a lot of reasons and, and getting diagnostics is tough. Um, there are other categories though. So the equivalent of uh, say noise like a tinnitus um, can show up as uh, a visual uh, phenomenon instead. Um, so there's, for example, visual snow syndrome. I'm not sure if you've uh, heard about this, but the concept is that uh, in contrast to noise that people hear, it's noise that people see instead. And um, there are certain um, clinical populations that suffer from this, and it's unknown whether uh, it correlates to specific um, cortical processes that could be modulated with neurofeedback. So um, something I'd recommend looking into further. Okay, I didn't know that. All right. Uh, so with that, that completes the examination of the committee. Um, is there, if there are any questions from the audience, either here or online via Zoom, uh, now's the time. Actually, I, I have one, if uh, there's time. Casper Smith here. I have a voice from above. <laughs> Can we figure out who it is? If you're able to see me. Yes, or hear me. Yes, we see you, Casper. Go ahead. Oh, great. I'll just close my door. Um, Timo, thanks so much for a seminal presentation. Since you're an expert and I'm just a novice in this field, um, I thought it would be interesting to hear sort of the clinical perspectives of this because uh, I feel like that's uh, what's foundational for much basic research in our field how to translate this into clinical value in the end. Um, do you have some insights based on the project that you've been going through and leading to such a great extent? Yeah, I think, I think this is something I can say for myself. I don't know how to measure it, but um, before the PhD, I did not have that much confidence in performing a study in spatial neglect patients. And now, having gone through this and how to train alpha and seeing what happens and what to say to people who are about to do it and to see that some effects are sometimes there, but not the ones you hope for. And now I feel confident in doing so. So that's something you might not be able to measure, but I do feel confident in, um, in pursuing this as a, as, a, as a therapy for spatial neglect patients. Um, but it's still, it's something that, it, multiple research groups are also working on, so I'm also paying uh, an attention to uh, to that. Mm. Fascinating. I think what you're saying about the difficulty of rationalizing these clinical double-blinded studies, uh, but I think that potential might be uh, exciting to delve in. It's certainly been um, really enthusiastic and a pleasure uh, seeing passion for neurofeedback. Actually, that's a bit contagious. So um, I want to thank you, Tim. I admire you greatly for your scientific ability. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Are there any other questions? Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for that presentation as well. Um, I, I'm thinking about the, the practical issues of using neurofeedback because you need a certain uh, neural correlate to uh, analyze, uh, analyze live. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a delay to show the participant uh, what you're uh, analyzing. So, some correlates, do you think there's some correlates that are easier to look at and some that are more difficult and mm -hmm. which do you think are? Uh, provide the most opportunities that we can look at. And, uh... Yeah, I mean, uh, just like Sarang said, we don't know the correlates of this, these flashes these, um, that appear. So we need a strong correlate and some, hopefully a couple of studies that shows that this correlate is really correlating with this and it doesn't vary across conditions. So, so, and some correlates are better than others. I chose alpha because it's one of the strongest electrophysiological measures we have. I think the band that's, that's strongest to see. So 
I sort of chose that and people can change their alpha more readily um, and specifically change it in the parietal cortex uh, more readily than other measures. Um, and it's, it's at the cortical level. So that means that I can use MEC, which is close to it. If I wanted to get subcortical with a MEC, I wouldn't be able to do so. It's fluctuating very fast. So I need something like MEC, which is also measuring very fast. So you, you have to tailor it to, to the individual thing. But I've seen changes in ERP responses where you have, for example, an MMN paradigm where you have, this is where you, you play a sound, you say beep, 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 pop, beep, 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 pop. And what you're trying to do is the brain is gonna react to that deviation. And you are still able, if you're then playing a Disney film while the participant is viewing this, you make the Disney film less visible, more grainy, whenever they aren't having this deviance response, and you can change this deviance response with this Disney film. So, and these ERP responses, these are sort of fundamental to how we react to stimuli. And um, I, I was, I mean, I was surprised when I read that. I think there are many brain processes that we just don't know yet that we can actually influence. Yeah, I guess the brain is uh, is complicated enough that you can find some correlate somewhere, and then you can modulate that, analyze it, and modulate it in some way. Yeah, and that will give you the, the behavioral response. Okay? Yeah, the effect you're looking for. Yeah, but I mean, <clears throat> if you, for example, brain volume, <laughs> like if you're measuring brain volume, obviously you cannot regulate your brain volume online. Um, there might also be areas that you just cannot regulate, like, for example, there are areas involved in regulation per se. Um, so that would be a paradox to regulate that area. Uh, there might be things like that. And there might be areas where TMS or TDCS is actually the better option. Um, and we should, you know, combine methods throughout neural, neural science. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions. So the committee will now leave the room, including the online committee, uh, to evaluate the defense and sign all the relevant documents. After that, the PhD student, Timo, will receive the result of the assessment. Uh, thank you. Uh, you guys can stay seated or uh, discuss here. Uh, the committee, we leave the room uh, to do this. Thanks. <laughs> On behalf of the graduate school, I wish to thank the members of the assessment committee, um, and I would like to uh, congratulate Dr. Timo, uh, Timo Quima uh, on his successful PhD defense. Uh, we have another one. Congratulations again, Dr. Krama. Uh, on behalf of the Graduate School, I want to thank everybody involved with the assessment of this thesis, and, uh, and of course, for Timo and uh, the audience's participation uh, during this academic event today. Uh, I believe Timo has some facilities planned later on at the main CFIN building, and uh, I'd like uh, to thank Dr. Krama again for his delightful presentation and for his, uh, his work these past few years. Thank you again. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> yeah, thank you all who came here and everyone online as well. Thank you, uh, Jotty. Thanks to the chairman and thank you, Julian, as well. I mean, it was, this was a cool experience as well as something I had to do. Um, I'm glad it's over. I don't want to do it again right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, we have a small reception at the Seafin location which is just over there about. And I think we have enough alcohol to run a small village. <laughs> uh, so um, I hope to see you all there who can, even those online who can make it. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you all for, for coming again. <laughs>